Anyways, no further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Brad Wall, the most popular Premier in the country. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bruce. I appreciate that. It has been a busy off-season in Rider Nation, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a busy off-season in sports in general in Saskatchewan. We, uh, we took the off-season to go into Alberta and steal the uh, Grey Cup champion head coach and coaching staff from the Eskimos and a lot of their players. We stole the uh, professional lacrosse team from Edmonton and they were champions uh, this year playing out of Saskatoon. And if you guys in the province ever get a professional hockey team, we might steal that too. <laughs> Thanks very much, Bruce, for the introduction. And uh, just appreciation to EPAC for uh, allowing us to come here and visit with you for a little bit and share some thoughts. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's an important opportunity, especially given where we're at with respect to the, uh, the energy business in Canada, uh, in our province, in yours, and across the country. Um, I, I just want to say off, off the top that we were humbled to get re-elected as we did on the 4th of April. Uh, and we take our, uh, uh, the obligations, the campaign promises that we made very, very seriously. The overarching theme was an economic one, that we would continue to ensure strength for our economy and approach to diversification. And for us, that means stability. That means that investors from this province and from our own and from outside of Western Canada should expect taxation stability and royalty stability uh, in our province and they'll get exactly that whether they're in the oil business or the potash business or uh, or whether they're uh, involved in innovation or manufacturing that's a commitment we made in the election and we've kept in the recent budget we've tabled i have to tell you it's a it's a deficit budget uh, the first deficit one we've tabled we went into deficit this year for obvious reasons and we're at a, about a 430 million dollar deficit we're going to get back to balance in 1718 we've made that commitment so next year we'll be implementing a balanced budget but in the meantime we do not think it's the right time for any more surprises they're for birthday parties and not for an economy when it's uh, in many respects facing the headwinds of, uh, of lower commodity prices i want to say then thanks to the people in this room as so many of you are vested in our province, so many of you have indirectly and directly created jobs for Saskatchewan people, the people for whom I work. Uh, and I don't think politicians say thank you enough, uh, because especially in this environment, there is great risk that comes with those investments. And we've seen a number of companies, and Raging River is one of them, but a number of them of late highlight the fact that they will be investing disproportionately, perhaps, in our province. And so let me just say thank you very, very much for that. It means a great deal to Saskatchewan, and we're going to try to work to earn your business. I would encourage more of that. If you like that stability, uh, which we've committed to, and maybe uh, if you're interested in a jurisdiction that's going to always be there to uh, defend the interests of the industry because it's good for the province, then maybe, the, maybe we, you, you might want to invest a little bit more uh, in Saskatchewan. <clears throat> Um, I also want to thank the, the, uh, the, the members that are represented here and, and those who are perhaps not members of EPAC but have, have joined as guests. I want to uh, thank them for what they've done in terms of a response to Fort Mac. Uh, it has been a remarkable, res remarkable response from the energy sector in your province and we have responded in kind in Saskatchewan, not the government per se, although we've done our part, I hope, but uh, our businesses. Uh, and. Uh, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, worthy, again, the opportunity is worthy, again, to say thanks to all of you for your response. What is good for Fort McMurray is good for all of Canada. It's most assuredly good for the province of Saskatchewan. <clears throat> I want to read you an email that I received last year. It is a fairly somber email with a bit of a strange subject line, and, and I'll just read it all. The subject is... The, the email is from a, a, a woman, a mom and a, and a wife named Lisa. And the subject line is, thank you from a rig pig's wife. It says this, first, I hate the term rig pig. I only use the term so that you might hopefully read this email. I, I think I would have read it anyway. I just wanted to say thanks for sticking up for the oil field. 
My husband started working in the PAT 17 years ago. We made the decision for him to take a lease hands job only three weeks after we were married because we couldn't afford to pay back the student loans that we had accumulated. It wasn't an easy choice, but it has defined our lives. We are extremely fortunate to have two sons. As my husband has uh, always worked away, uh, him coming and going is our normal. My husband, Derek, has worked everywhere from Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Libya, Ukraine, Iraq, Saudi Arabia. We have had an amazing life because of the sacrifices that he's made for us. His hard work, his dedication, and his work ethic has given him an opportunity to work his way up to becoming an oil field consultant. <clears throat> On 16 January 2015, Derek came home from an early spring thaw. It was a little unnerving. We canceled our holiday uh, as we were unaware as to when he might get back to work. That was six months ago. We've had zero income since. Zero. There will be no unemployment insurance for Derek to collect. Nothing. It's all on us. And nobody seems to understand or care. Nobody seems to understand or care is how Lisa feels. And I would expect it's how many others feel across Western Canada and in Newfoundland and Labrador who have lost their jobs or suffered some other economic dislocation as a family. I think it's easy to understand why Lisa would feel this way, never mind the state of the industry, never mind falling oil prices. Because while her husband Derek was out of work, consider what she witnessed. She witnessed Canada's number one trading partner and friend reject the Keystone Pipeline, which on a prima facie basis as a pipeline should be approved. If it, would, if it would have been approved, I think it would have been the 92nd pipeline carrying hydrocarbons over the 49th parallel. She watched that pipeline rejected, notwithstanding the fact that oil on rail has increased 5,000% in that same country, in the United States. And we all know that spills from a rail are far more difficult to clean up and can be more dangerous than the challenges that might come with pipelining oil. She must have despaired at that, I would expect, when she saw that on the news. She must have also been a little bit saddened by the fact that that very same rail versus pipeline apparently carried little currency in her own country, where some neighboring provinces and other provinces, there, there are some NGOs certainly in those areas, and sometimes governments said no to pipelines, said no to the chance for us as Canadians to get more of a return for the oil and maybe give a chance for Derek to get back to work just a little bit sooner. How must Lisa have felt when she saw a brand new federal government actually add to the NEB rules and regulations in terms of pipeline approval? Incredibly, making the test for Canadian oil as it relates to pipeline approval, greater, more intense than the test for oil from foreign countries. It's exactly what happened. That's our reality today. How would it have felt for Lisa to know, and Derek to know, that the other addition to the NEB process was that now we were going to ask the question about the, the carbon footprint, the source GHGs of the oil in the first place, when we don't ask that about other products that are made and shipped across this country. And she must have been incredulous at the talk, and the talk that continues still today, of a national carbon tax. I wonder if she thought about this. Can you imagine if premiers or a prime minister or industry groups would have proposed a new car manufacturing tax in 2009, when that sector was reeling, when that sector was shedding jobs by the thousands and when they needed a direct bailout from the federal government? Imagine, the, imagine some premier or, or some policy person proposing a new tax on that sector, or perhaps proposing that we measure the carbon footprint of a manufactured car in some part of the country before we allow it on rail to go to other parts of the country to replace the need perhaps for import vehicles. No wonder Lisa thinks, probably still today, that nobody understands. And it's Lisa's case. 
and cases like hers and Derek's that we need to present, the questions that she would posit, we need to ask those over and over and over again if we're going to see progress in terms of, of well, I'll say the rehabilitation of the brand of this particular industry in our own country. Today, there continues an existential threat to this industry, the, the industry that's so important in my province. It's posed by those, some, who, would, who just aren't comfortable that we have all this oil and what oil might mean. And it's also posed by some who just want to shut it down completely. And that might seem alarmist or overly dramatic, except that it's not. The opposition comes from an ever-growing matrix of activists, from supporters of the Leap Manifesto. In Saskatchewan, we call them grim leapers. <laughs> More about them in a moment. It also comes from the divestment movement, which we don't actually talk about very much. The divestment movement where pension funds and universities and faith-based organizations are, are trying to direct investment away from a sector based, I think, on not entirely factual evidence. They are responding to the call that we move rapidly to the quote post-carbon economy. We're in the middle of a battle and frankly we haven't been winning very many battles. When I say we, I mean this sector and the resource importance of Western Canada. And I fear we're in danger of losing more battles if we're not vigilant. We're at a disadvantage in some ways. The other side has the glamour of Daryl Hannah and and we've got Rex Murphy. <laughs> I'd rather hang out with Rex Murphy, but you know, it's, he may not be as compelling for the media as Sterile Hannah. But here's something that we do have in abundance, ladies and gentlemen, and we've always had them. We've not always used them, but we've always had them, and that is the facts. We have facts on our side, evidentiary cases to make for this industry and its, important to the country, its importance to the country. The second president of the United States, John Adams, said facts are stubborn things, and they are. So I humbly suggest to all of you today that we urgently, all of us need to redouble, redouble every effort to disseminate those facts, that we would become ever more determined purveyors of the truth about this sector and about how you conduct business and how you have conducted business for many, many decades. I know you're doing this already. This organization is, and CAP has been doing it. On websites, on every media platform, in conventional media, in advertising, in private conversations, but I suggest to you, it's still not enough. We have to keep making the case. We need to keep presenting the facts. So today I want to focus quickly on three areas where perhaps we can bring some facts to bear to, this, to, the, to the debate to the discussion around energy in Canada. First is that we need to address the notion that it's going to be a quick and easy transition to the quote unquote post-carbon economy. Second, we should answer the charge that the resource sector has not done enough by way of the environment, that somehow the Canadian energy sector are environmental laggards because that notion persists. And third, we must continue to forcefully make the case that pipelines are safe and they will benefit all of Canada, and while imperfect, better than all of the alternatives. On the first of these, moving to a post-carbon future, there's been a lot of, there really has been a lot of magical thinking in Canada. Um, a few years ago, there was a blogger from Fort Mac that pointed, uh, pointed some of this out. Her name is Teresa Wells, and she wrote an open letter uh, to the great environmental engineer, uh, Neil Young. <laughs> she wanted, uh, she wanted, she wanted to provide Neil with a bit of a reality check, and here's what she wrote. She said, quote, you know, Neil, if oil was replaced tomorrow by another energy source, I would be okay with that. If you could make sure we could continue to connect all the remote parts of this nation and others and get our goods and products to the people who need them and enable us to continue our lives, but in a greener way, not reliant on fossil fuels, I'd be behind that 100%, but that isn't the reality right now. Our farms and our factories and even our families currently rely on the safe, reliable production of oil, close the quote, Teresa Wells, is right. There will be no quick transition to the post-carbon world. It's happening. The transition's occurring and we should be a part of it in this country. But by 2040, the International Energy Agency predicts fossil fuels will still account 
for 75 percent of energy consumption on the planet. There's going to be more wind and there's going to be more solar and there should be. But right now there are still limits as to what wind and solar can do in terms of base load notwithstanding improvements in that technology. For example, according to author Matt Ridley, we would need to build 100,000 wind turbines on 30,000 square miles of land, that's an area the size of Scotland, just to keep up with the annual increase in world electricity consumption. So that, those are those who may not be comfortable with the energy uh, reality of the country. What about the, the, the Grim Leapers? We should creak open that door to the basement, peer down into the details of the Leap Manifesto so that we're prepared for it down the road so we can defend it. Because there's, there's a major political party in this country that are adherents to it, that, don't, that want to discuss it and move towards adopting some or all of it. In our province, the NDP's opposition finance critic actually believes this should be debated, that there's merit to the Leap Manifesto, the, the contents of which would destroy our economy literally would destroy the economy of Saskatchewan. It doesn't like modern farming, agriculture, doesn't like mining, it certainly doesn't like oil and gas, and doesn't want to build any more pipelines. And the finance critic uh, in our Legislative Assembly, and I, should, I shouldn't be partisan, I'll only use initials from now on, the NDP opposition finance critic <laughs> is supportive of that. So too is the person leading the Saskatchewan NDP renewal effort. The LEAP Manifesto is influencing some people, ladies and gentlemen. We ought not to be, we ought not to assume that everybody thinks that it's, that it's crazy. I think we've made that mistake in the past. In the words of Rex Murphy, he characterizes the LEAP Manifesto as, quote, a cascade of unexamined and baseless assertions and a manifest distaste for reality. And so when we open up that creaky basement door and descend down into the, into the absurdity, we see the claim that Canada should shift to 100% renewables by 2050 and that it's based on two studies, including the work of Stanford University professor Mark Jacobson, who has completed a wind, water and sunlight energy roadmap for 139 countries. According to the roadmap, for Canada to reach 100% renewables by 2050, we would now, hang on now, we would have to build more than 22,000 uh, 5 megawatt wind power stations offshore, there are none, currently, more than 40,000 on onshore wind farms, 1,900 tidal turbines, 28,000 wave power devices, seven swans of swimming, 290,000 commercial rooftop solar systems, 5 million residential rooftop solar systems, 5,200 solar utility plants at a cost of 1.38 trillion American dollars to 13. Adjust that for inflation, adjust that for currency, the number is 1.86 trillion dollars from this country, that would be, by the way, triple the national debt, a number so big as to be meaningless. But it is a platform for, may I say, an assault on the thing that Canada, one of the things that Canada does so well, the resource business, the energy business. The cost, the complete impracticality of the Leap Manifesto is not the most distressing thing to me, actually. What's even more pernicious, in my view, is, is the attitude behind the LEAP Manifesto. It is, may I say, profound snobbery. That is at the heart of that document. And here's why I would say that. The LEAP Manifesto wants to expand certain sectors of the economy, certain sectors where the jobs are more worthy, is the implication. For example, it emphasizes caregiving and teaching and social work and the arts and the public interest media as examples of some of these jobs, and boy, they are all important. No one would disagree that they're important. But they all need public money, indirectly or directly, to sustain them. So they all need jobs like truck drivers, and drillers, and oil field consultants, and cementers, and people that work in the mines, and small business women and men, and farmers, in order to support the jobs that they seem to indicate in the, manifest are, in the manifesto are more worthy. Because these are the jobs that have sustained families and quality of life in this country for decades. They've made Canada a leader in terms of resource extraction since its earliest days. They've created the wealth to enable us to hire more nurses, caregivers in Saskatchewan. 3,000 more nurses under our government than there were under the other guys. 
you know, and it was funded by a strong economy, by people paying taxes, by the resource sector. 600 more doctors, caregivers practicing in Saskatchewan because they were funded by a strong economy. It allows us to hire 400 more teachers, just like the manifesto would want us to do in Saskatchewan, that economy, and more social workers. It's allowed us to increase support for the arts and federally, now there's gonna be more money for CBC. All of that comes from a tax base, something that's sustainable and lasting, something that is driven not only by, but importantly contributed by the energy sector, our resource sector. So in pursuit of a post-carbon utopia, conceptualized and designed in a lot of comfortable homes in maybe downtown Toronto and other large urban centers, we risk complacency, ladies and gentlemen. Let's not be. Let's engage in this debate. Let's not make the mistakes of the past where we've kind of ceded ground and expected, well, people aren't gonna believe that stuff. Let's be engaged and debate it meaningfully and with the facts and be proactive with respect to some of the stuff that's coming from people that aren't comfortable with the fact that Canada has the third greatest oil reserves on the planet. That's not to say, and please don't misunderstand me, that we need to do more in terms of climate change. In our province, we've set our own goal to, uh, to move to renewables, a 50% renewable profile by 2030, and that's not long off. And we've already partnered with First Nations as one of the conveyances for that aspiration, and we're gonna get there. In Saskatchewan and Alberta, though, as we move to more renewables, one of the constraints we have is the current state of technology, notwithstanding its improvement, and the weather. When it's 30 below or 30 above, the wind's just not always blowing. And there doesn't seem to be as many people calling for an end to fossil fuels when it's 30 below, I've noticed. <laughs> With the current technology, renewables can only take us so far, and we should be investing in those renewables so they can take us further and finally answer this question for us. China's investing heavily in renewables. India's investing heavily in renewables. But both of those countries are also embracing fossil fuels, coal plants, more on that in a moment, but other forms of fossil fuels. Power production all over the world will continue to rely on fossil fuels, and so too will our transportation systems, and so too will about 6,000 other products from dice to yarn to the smartphone you probably are checking right now because maybe the speech is getting a little long. <laughs> fossil fuels are going to be with us for a while, and there will be an ongoing environmental impact and we better be prepared to mitigate it. We better be prepared to do whatever we can to ensure that this sector of ours that we're so proud of is sustainable and is the source of pride actually that it is for all of us, but a source of pride that it might be for all of Canada. The fact of the matter is, is that there are few nations on the planet that have more stringent regulations and standards governing the energy sector than the Dominion of Canada. And we're fortunate to have an industry in this country that takes its environmental responsibilities seriously. A lot of the companies represented in this room are going beyond what they're required to do by regulation or by law. That's probably not happening in a lot of the countries that compete with us in terms of worldwide energy markets. And on the issue of climate change, industry and governments are taking action and some have chosen from a provincial perspective to price carbon in different ways. Carbon taxes, a levy here for a while. Others are looking at conservation, lots of talk about cap and trade. In Saskatchewan, we're going to take a different path and we have been for a while. We're not discounting what others are doing as we take that, that other path, but it is a bit different. It strikes me and it strikes our government that there's three things Canadians can do about climate change. You can work, focus on, you don't have to uh, focus on just one of these, by the way, but here are the three things, uh, principal reactions mm -hmm. to climate change. One is to focus on adaptation. You know, the Premier Pazlowski from Yukon will tell you, there's a school he's got, that, a fairly new school, that's falling in on itself because of the permafrost melting. So have, have whatever debate you want about where climate change comes from or whether it exists. Talk to the Premiers of the territories and they'll tell you they're living it every day and our country does not focus enough on adaptation as one of the responses to climate change. So that's number one. Number two is that we would reduce our own emissions and, and impact our own behavior. We're 1.6% of global emissions, but you know the work should be expected of us as well. And the third thing though is technology, focusing on the global challenge, focusing on technological innovation that will actually solve the problem in the medium and the long term. We believe in Saskatchewan that our time is better spent, our public dollars are better spent focusing on the technological solutions, and so we've invested more than a billion dollars in Boundary Dam 3. That's a 
That's a carbon capture and sequestration project at a coal fire plant in southeast Saskatchewan, many of you know well, at, at, near Estevan. BD3 will capture about 800,000 tons of CO2 this year, the equivalent of taking 200,000 cars off the road. And by the way, it's working. We had commission year challenges. They've been resolved by engineers at SAS Power, and it's meeting its uh, nameplate capacity uh, uh, objectives. And we have been welcoming visitors from all over the world because we think and they think that it's probably a game changer. And do you know why they would think it's a game changer? It's because as of we speak here now, or I guess I'm doing the speaking, 2,400 coal plants are being built in, in Asia, principally in Asia, not only there. So here we are in our country, we're having this long protracted debate about a national carbon tax and cap and trade and fiscal instruments that may or may not hurt our economy at a time it could least afford it for 1.6% of global emissions. Meanwhile, 2,400 coal plants are being built. It's our view in Saskatchewan that we need to do all three of those things, but maybe our focus can be with all of our wealth and all of our capacity for innovation to solve the problem, to get to a transition energy that's cleaner, to clean up coal. That plant in southeast Saskatchewan, by the way, will burn uh, coal uh, about three times cleaner than combined cycle natural gas. BHP Billiton recently signed a partnership with our government with SAS Power. It's a $20 million partnership to establish the CCS Knowledge Center. BHP's just signed a deal over in Beijing. They're going to look to apply CCS technology to the steel industry. These are solutions. And it might take a while to get there, but it's our, our view in Saskatchewan that's worth pursuing the actual solution to the problem and perhaps not endangering the economy that will have to pay for those solutions along the way. Meanwhile, the, the energy sector, your sector, has been busy working on the problem too, whether it's Shell or the Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Alliance uh, or the Climate Change and Emissions Management Corporation. Ladies and gentlemen, billions of dollars are being spent in this country committed to ensure the energy sector operates in an environmentally sustainable manner, operating in a way to reduce emissions. And yet we still have the caricature from some outside our country and some within our nation that, that we're heedlessly plundering and despoiling the environment when it comes to resource extraction. So that tells me we need to do a better job of telling our story and that seems like an over simplistic solution but I'm, I'm in politics, that is the solution. Saying it over and over and over again in every media platform, getting this message out, both our record and our vision for what this sector can be in terms of its relationship to the environment. Abraham Lincoln noted that the best vindication against slander is the truth. We should be in that business. We should be in the fact business. I'm not going to get into too many details about the pipeline uh, issue except to say this. Hopefully, and I, I, maybe I'm naive, I'm pretty optimistic, at least about Energy East. Last month there was a poll released by Bruce Anderson's Abacus Data. The poll showed that just 32% of the population believes no new pipeline should ever be built. 68% kind of think they should be. 68% aren't necessarily comfortable with all the rhetoric against pipelines. They want to make sure that they are constructed, uh, that they're following NEB regulations, that there's a rigorous process, that the industry itself it's doing, is doing its part to be sustainable. But 68% support the pipelines. Here's what he says. Here's the, the pollster's quote. Uh, in a sense, social license clearly exists. A broad cross-section of voters and the large majority of liberal voters feel uncomfortable with the anti-pipeline argument, end quote. In a sense, he says, social license exists. And it should, if you think about it. Canadians are being pragmatic and generous here when they recognize that the license exists. That license was paid for by decades of economic development. Hundreds of thousands of jobs created directly and indirectly by this industry. That's social license. Wealth transfers in this country, directly and indirectly funded by this sector, that's social license. A record of caring about the environment of sustainable practices, that's social license. And so if this is true, if 68% of the people think, yeah, you know what, that makes sense, we have to continue to make that case. We need to drive it home in the context of not just Energy East, but other pipeline opportunities that exist uh, for, for our country and for our sector. 
I think Canadians might find it passing strange that while we're twisting ourselves into knots, and while we have this oil guilt, it would seem, other energy exporters are plowing right ahead. From 2010 to 14, U.S. crude oil pipeline network increased by more than 12,000 miles. 22% according to the Association of Oil Pipelines. The equivalent of 12 keystones happened in the United States, and we all remember the reason they gave for rejecting Keystone, don't you? Canadians seem to be receptive to the facts, ladies and gentlemen. And facts are stubborn things, but only if they are heard. And not once, not twice, not three times, but as I've said over and over again, they need to be heard. My advice, for what it's worth, is this, let's not be, and this isn't just for you, this is for governments who have an interest in this, because quality of life is paid for by the sector and by the jobs it's created. Let us not be complacent. Just about the time we think when we've said that thing enough, say it 12 more times, wherever you can. Annoy people at Tim Hortons, <laughs> or, or at Starbucks, or wherever it is you go. Let us present those facts directly and honestly and often let us present them for Lisa and Derek, her community, her province, and her country. Thanks for your time today. Thank you.